tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome to Quick Charge. It's October 10th, 2024, and I'm your host, Joe Boris. Now, it is October 10th, the date that Tesla is holding its exciting new We Robot press event, but that hasn't happened yet. So, we're going to talk about something else. And that something else is this the EPA announced $1 billion in grants for electric school buses and heavy duty vehicles earlier this year. And that grant money is finally starting to make its way out into the public school districts throughout the country. And we're starting to see some really good uptake on these. Bluebird, for example, just delivered its 2000th electric school bus to Clark County Schools in Nevada. And Oakland has now become the first school district in the U.S. to deploy a 100% electric school fleet with vehicle-to-grid technology. So this is obviously something that's taking off, and we want to encourage and promote more electric vehicle adoption, especially around public schools where you have kids walking around at surface level, breathing in those diesel emissions all day. We want to get rid of that. So this is great stuff. And as we talk about the benefits to these communities, we have to also acknowledge that underserved and underprivileged communities tend to benefit more or to a higher degree than other communities. That's why it's so exciting to see the first sovereign tribal nation switching over to electric school buses. Now, Minnesota's only public school district located within a sovereign tribal nation added two electric school buses to its fleet earlier this week. This makes Red Lake School District number 38 one of the first public school districts in the U.S. with a predominantly indigenous population at 98%, to tap into the funding from EPA's Clean School Bus Program, which granted the district $790,000 to buy electric school buses and chargers. The school district's curriculum includes teaching the Ojibwe language and other Ojibwe traditions. Tim Lutz, superintendent of Red Lake School, said, As an educational institution, our priority is to provide learning opportunities for students and community members in as many ways as we can. We do this not only through our curriculum, but also by embracing best practices in energy and sustainability while preparing our students for future careers. We are proud to have acquired these two electric school buses, and we believe they will serve us well. The Tribal Nations District, which serves 1,560 students, partnered with Highland Electric Fleets, a company that provides electrification as a service for school bus fleets throughout North America, to procure two Bluebird Type C Vision Electric school buses and two EV chargers for its bus depot. The Vision Electric charges in six to eight hours and has a range of up to 130 miles, with a Cummins Power Drive 7000 propulsion system and a 155 kilowatt hour battery. Each of the new electric buses will transport about 50 students at a time, and with the charging infrastructure in place, the buses will have an average of 110 miles per day with a full midday charge. Together, the two buses are expected to cover about 10,000 miles a year. Now, Highland is doing a great job with this. They're providing school districts with solutions not only for how to acquire the buses in an economical way, but also in how to get them charged. But they're not the only company out there offering electrification as a service. And today's guest represents Volterra Power. So as we've been discussing here, there's a ton of new federal aid. And even at the state and municipal level down to the utility level, there's a ton of incentives out there for buses, transit fleets to electrify their operations and move people around in a cleaner, more efficient way. But that raises a whole bunch of new problems that they've never had to deal with before. And so to help answer some of the questions that might come up for bus fleets that are looking to electrify, I've got Matt Kerwood. He's a senior director of sales and business development for Volterra. Matt, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thank you. Now, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah. Uh, Listen, Matt, you know, you and I, first of all, uh, have spoken at least once before and kind of been trying to wrap my head around this process for not only municipalities, but also transit authorities who for years and years and years, really the last 50, 150, 100 years, have just been able to go to a gas station, fill up the vehicles and park them. And it's not something that they've had to think about. So for these agencies that are now electrifying their buses and they are suddenly faced with the challenge of how to manage electrification, how does Volterra kind of approach that and meet those needs? 
Well, there's a lot to unpack there. And uh, to give you an idea of what Volterra does, is it's a fit-for-purpose entity where we go in and we plan with the customer on how to get to their end goal, which is electrifying their fleet. So within that, it can, it, there's components of we finance the whole project for them, so we provide all the capital. We also will um, go in and part of that analysis will be figuring out if the existing facility is the right facility to electrify. As you mentioned, these a lot of these programs have had, uh, called it, um, an historic background, and so often the fuel type may have been diesel solution, and that may not necessarily be the best uh, location to electrify as a result in terms of access to power and the cost to bring power to the site. So we go in, we do a full analysis of that. We really figure out, is this a solution we can electrify at the existing location or not? Um, and is that does that make the most economic sense? Then we actually design it to, um, bespoke. So we'll actually, if there's a maintenance facility that needs to be on site or bus washing and such. And so it gets tailored for them and then uh, we operate it and maintain it for them. So when you have this huge influx of funding, which is available right now to a lot of these bus fleets, uh, whether it be transit entities, whether it be college campuses, whether it be school districts, um, and to give you an idea, in 2023 alone, there was over $1.4 billion made available by the EPA for school districts on a federal level. Um, which is really exciting, uh, and then on the on the from an FTA standpoint, uh, on the public transit side, last year there was 1.7 billion. So with all these funds, there's a real sense of call it urgency to understand how to utilize those funds, how to apply for those funds, uh, how to capture them, and then how to how to utilize that money in the most effective way for the best result to get an electrified fleet. One of the things that, you know, I've talked to other people at Volterra at various trade shows and, and different okay. electrification events. One of the things that struck me as novel and innovative was this idea of a centralized charging location that serves multiple fleets. Is this something that you've seen put in play in different municipalities and in different cities where real estate really comes at a premium and they may be looking for a solution that's in one location? Yeah, um, I would say like, so our business model covers not only buses, but it also covers other heavy duty markets such as uh, trucking, drayage. Uh, and then we also go to other, uh, on the other end of the spectrum to shared ride services and, uh, and goods movements uh, in the light duty space. So we've seen a lot of uh, activity on those sides of it, where we've um, we've seen specific locations where we'll go out, we'll purchase a strategically located site, and then effectively market it to a customer base where they can utilize the they can take a number of stalls. So it almost becomes a per stall rental scenario as opposed to being having to take the whole facility as such. So. We've seen that it works. It actually can create a lot of efficiencies for companies who are trying to scale their electric fleets. So uh, rather than trying to do it all in one lump, which is for one extremely capital intensive and for a lot of folks out of reach, it by phasing it in, these types of solutions really do work, Joe. So yeah, um, we've seen it and it's been quite successful. Obviously, Volterra is a company now that's been in existence for a couple of years. You're talking about these kind of efficiencies that have been realized. So this is not a new thing. It's not a conceptual startup. You have done these kind of implementations in the past, and the fleets have had a positive response moving into this. Yeah, yeah. Um, an example of a site that we have operational would be, uh, say, uh, just outside the port of Long Beach in Linwood, California. And that is a trucking facility, uh, 12 megawatt site, actually it's the largest uh, in North America of its kind. Uh, so we've seen, and that handles up to 200 charging cycles per day. Uh, so in the case of having, uh, I guess, if you will, a, a, a product that's out there that's serving customer base successfully, yeah, we've got great feedback from, from examples like that. Yeah. So 
Yeah, in summary, I'd say to you that it, it, it's it's out there, it's operating, it's working. We've got a customer base satisfied, beyond satisfied with it with its results, and and this is just going to continue to be replicated across multiple business streams. Is the way we look at it. And that was a site actually that I was familiar with. I was out there at Electrify oh. Expo at Long Beach and uh, also at ACT Expo when it was first announced. Honestly, when you and I spoke earlier in this week as we were prepping for this. I had thought that you guys were only in California, but that's not accurate. No, we we have a number of locations across the U.S., uh, in, in Georgia, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, Arizona, to name a few. Uh, we've got over 20 sites that are under various stages of construction development. Uh, so no, we're scaling at a pretty rapid rate here across, you know, as I said, multiple states. And we've deployed over $150 million in capital to date both in existing sites and future sites that are, as I said, are under development. So yeah, not just California, that's for sure. You guys don't sell electric vehicles. Like nobody can go to Volterra and say, you know, hey, we want six of these buses and charging and we want an all-in-one solution. And that's just not something that you guys offer. How do you find these fleets? How do they find you? Because I imagine that they're not calling whether it's Thomas built or, you know, Bluebird buses. And then they're saying, oh yeah, call Volterra, make those guys uh, figure this out for you. Oh, I don't think there's a one answer to that. I, I would say to you that, frankly, from the proven product, like an example of Linwood, it it speaks for itself, not only in terms of its, uh, its scale and its capabilities, but the fact that we were able to go live with that site from start to finish in 18 months is extremely uh, impressive from a standpoint of how the industry is is viewing the process and and that it typically the process does take longer than 18 months so from a track record standpoint from a proof point standpoint we i think we've got some great examples of what we can do uh i would say to you that our, as a result our reputation has also got to a point where folks are coming to us and they are starting to understand that the brand um, does represent quality and it does represent a partnership. And because it's bespoke, that's where we find that we have a real strategic advantage. And what I mean by that is if we're providing all the capital to do this project, it really opens up the, the fact that these projects can move quicker than what may be first anticipated a lot of the times we see a customer base trying to um, call it work within um, their confines, trying to figure out the the financial capabilities of their own entities to be able to do something like this and not even realizing that there's actually organizations like us that are prepared to fund the project and lease it back. So from that standpoint, the capital standpoint, I think that's really exciting for a lot of entities out there to really embrace it. I'd also add that because it's bespoke and because there's no one size fits all scenario, no matter what industry we're talking about here, but to electrify a fleet, it really needs a deep dive and, a, and it's quite complex. And so engagement early often is the best way um, to get the right, I get, get to the right finishing point. And that's where I think a lot of folks really benefit from engaging companies like Volterra. Yeah. And it's a true partnership because you've got your infrastructure that you're building out. You want that infrastructure to benefit someone and in order to make your revenue model work. So it really is a true partnership where your interests are perfectly aligned in many cases. Yeah. I, um, this is, it's a difficult industry as far as we're all trying to um, strive for something here. This, the goal is for zero emission fleets, um, well, let's say globally, right? But in the case of Volterra, we're focused on the North American market. So when we think of it in terms of what's the end goal, we all want to get to that. We all want to have zero emission fleets. So we have to play a role of um, supporting our customer base and making it as easy as possible for them to be able to make that conversion. You know, school districts are a perfect example of that where there's so many complexities just within electrifying their fleet, yet they are responsible for all other aspects of it running a school district beyond just the transportation programs. So if we can step in, we can educate them, we can support them to get to that end goal, to capture that grant money, for example, um, and to help them understand how to convert their existing sites or that the fact that they need a new site to do it, 
to reach a scenario where they're effectively providing clean air in their local communities, I mean, that's a win for everyone. And so if we can step in to help accelerate that by funding the project or supporting them to, uh, to catch a grant money, then that's, that's what we're here to do. Matt, I think that was a perfect response. Uh, again, I really appreciate your time here. I know we're coming to the end of our time commitment. I want to be sensitive of that, uh, especially since I kept you waiting as long as I did. So apologies there. Um, for people who are listening to this, who are tuning in, who are hearing about Volterra for the first time, if they could take away just one thing from this interview and, and this conversation, what would you hope that would be? I would say um, that it is achievable. And I think it can be for a lot of entities, organizations, uh, it can seem a little daunting or there may be doubt as to how to how to get to that end goal. But if you know what your end goal is, it is achievable. And it, it, there's examples of entities that have gone out and done it in the past without having the support of organizations like Volterra. But Volterra stepping into the mix, we can make the process so much easier efficient and more cost effective and really help you understand what's involved and make that process of change as easy as possible. So it, the takeaway I, I think I really want people to have is that you can do it and there's a lot of support out there to help you achieve that. Matt Kerwood, that was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, for people who are looking to get in touch with you to ask you questions, how do they find you? Uh, you can go to our website at volterrapower.com. Uh, uh, we're also on all the social media channels. You can tra track us down that way. And uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Once again, that's Matt Kerwood from Volterra Power. He's got a number of solutions there. And if you're a school district trying to figure out how to electrify, there's multiple school districts in a given area looking for a way to maximize the incentive dollars that they're getting and find a way to consolidate all their charging into one location definitely give Matt a call and see if there's a way that Volterra can help you. Now, we like to close off these shows talking about the environment, talking about sustainability. Today is no different. High Wind Scotland, the world's first floating wind farm, has returned from Norway and is back online. This was the world's first floating commercial scale wind farm, first deployed off the coast of Scotland. The site is now back in action after its five turbines were shipped to Norway for routine maintenance and hauled back. They're now up and running and gotta love that. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's all I've got for today, October 10th. Be sure to come back to Electric later on tonight. If you haven't seen it already, we're going to be live streaming the 1010 We Robot event as best we can. And uh, we'll have plenty of comments on that tomorrow, I'm sure. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of those.